Uh, John Defterius, Emerging Markets Editor and uh, anchor for CNN here based in Abu Dhabi. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be back in collaboration with the International Monetary Fund and the team shaping policy in the MENA region and specifically the regional economic outlook. Before we get started, this event is uh, being co-hosted by the Dubai International Financial Center, the DIFC, which has uh, served as a financial hub, of, of course, uh, globally at, at the crossroads of East and West, uh, and particularly active when it comes to the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia, or the Manasa region. Uh, arising from pandemic, building forward better in the Middle East and North Africa is the name of our uh, event today. And all I can say here is what a shock, uh, 14 full months uh, into the global pandemic of COVID-19. Uh, and can we say also the global response to the uh, pandemic as well. Uh, there has been a record amount of stimulus spending. And now as we have witnessed a continued drive, particularly in the G7 and G20 countries, of course, to develop the next stage of growth with a new round of infrastructure spending to make sure the current recovery is not a flash in the pan, if you will, but a sustainable one and in more than one ways. And I'll get to that in just a moment. It was uh, Sir Winston Churchill who rightly said, never let a good crisis go to waste in the aftermath of conflict and war, of course. But COVID-19 was the first global pandemic in a century and hit uh, every corner uh, of the world. And since we are in the Middle East and straddle, as I noted, the, at the crossroads of Asia, Europe, and Africa, it is fitting for us to take a deep dive today on the roadmap for uh, recovery. A major theme for us is that we need to ensure it does not remain a, a two-speed recovery. And I think this is the biggest, most critical issue that we face today, divided by the have and have nots of the region, uh, those who have the benefit of uh, fiscal buffers and sovereign savings, and those who do not have that luxury to be candid, but still had to re to respond to the challenge that's on the table. Now, as we've said in the past year, since the pandemic is global in nature, what happens anywhere has the danger of dragging on the effects of the pandemic uh, much longer than it needs to be. So how do we best shape this recovery? How to, do we best support the less fortunate and encourage the right spending and the right reforms to all secure policies that accelerate a green transition at the same time? We have to make sure that doesn't get overlooked in this uh, uh, pandemic and the recovery that's in front of us. Let me uh, welcome our guests that offer great regional diversity, which I think is excellent in both private and public sector roles that can discuss with great insight the role of public and private sector collaboration uh, investment, uh, both at the state level, but of course, from the private sector and the best fiscal policies in this transition to recovery. You see our guests in the box here. Jihad Azur is the Director of Middle East and Central Asia Department from the International Monetary Fund. It's always a pleasure and thanks uh, for the invitation, Jihad. Uh, Sarah al Suhaimi is the Chair of the Saudi Arabia Stock Exchange, uh, the Tadawa. Uh, Sarah, it's great to see you again and welcome back uh, to the, the forum. Ibrahim Al Badawi, Dr. Al Badawi is the Managing Director of the Economic Research Forum, uh, normally based in Cairo, but joining us from the DIFC itself. He has an office there. It's good to see you, Ibrahim. And Fadi Gandour is the Executive Chairman of the WAMDA Group. Uh, a well-known entrepreneur, and uh, since I've known him for a better part of a decade, uh, an advocate for economic reforms in the regions and how to streamline uh, business policy uh, to make it easier for people to invest, not only in one single country, but uh, cross borders and how do you uh, develop a startup culture. Uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping uh, things to note here. We're using the hashtag today of hashtag IMF MENA, that's I-M-F-M-E-N-A. So use that to uh, send your questions in. Uh, for those that are on the platform on Zoom today, there's a chat box that you can find at the bottom of the screen uh, and the very expert uh, support that I'm getting here from the International Monetary Fund is feeding those questions to me uh, via WhatsApp. I also wanted to notify you that there is uh, interpretation for you in Arabic if you prefer to listen to Arabic as well. Uh, when you do send the questions either in the chat box or, or onto social media, uh, do us a favor, uh, put your name across the organization you're representing and the city in which you're joining us from so we can get a sense of where these uh, participants are all uh, have a, a voice here in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, any questions, of course, just send us a, a note on uh, the social media platforms or we'll try to get all those questions in. We have three rounds of questions just to manage your expectations uh, with this expert group and then I'll open up the floor at least, at least for the last 20 minutes, if uh, not longer. If I may, uh, Jihad, I'd like to bring you in here and kind of have you benchmark the 
uh, the regional economic outlook. I, I think if I summarize it, I'd say decent growth of 4% from a very challenging 2020 because of what I talked about with the pandemic. Uh, the stimulus that was put forward, the debt levels that have risen as a result, uh, and the roadmap forward. How do we make that transition? Is that a good leaping off point for you? Thanks. John, thank you very much. And I would like also to thank and welcome all those who are uh, participating today and thank uh, our uh, uh, extraordinary set of speakers uh, for this important discussion. We are at a turning point. And um, after a year uh, of uh, an unprecedented crisis that uh, has not only uh, affected the region from the COVID-19 uh, standpoint, but also from uh, the WME shock with the uh, uh, sudden and severe drop in oil prices. We are now at the end of, I would say year one, the year of uh, facing the shock. We are now entering year two, which is the year of exiting the crisis and transitioning uh, into a more, I would say, sustainable level of growth. And let me summarize a bit how we see the situation in five slides, five key messages. One, um, the um, the race between vaccine and virus is still the most important element that will determine how 2021 will be. Uh, as the pandemic continues, second or third wave in certain countries, the speed of vaccination and the diversity of sources of vaccines will play an important role. And as we see in this slide, that we have great diversity, as, as you rightly said. There are countries who have already procured frozen. Uh, it looks like Jihad is uh, frozen here. We'll try to get him unstuck if we can. Uh, let's see. It looks like the Wi-Fi signal is uh, halting on his end. I become a divergence. Here, Monsieur. Okay, perfect. He's back uh, up. Jihad, uh, we, we had a slight uh, hesitation on your line there. Do you want to go back? Uh, to the beginning of your slide to make sure that the line is stable, please. Yeah, I was saying that uh, um, the, 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 the divergence in the recovery is in fact mainly due to the fact that we have countries where the level of vaccination will exceed 100% and others which, which at best will be at 20% of vaccination. The uh, second is um, we have three categories of countries. The early inoculators, most of them are the GCC countries, where already, and for example, uh, in the case of UEE where you are, already they have um, uh, inoculated a large portion of their population, and they are at the lead worldwide. Uh, we have also Morocco, and maybe others will come uh, as uh, part of the second group, which is the slow inoculators. Those will gradually start the inoculation, but will not achieve full immunity before end of 2022, mid of 2023. And then we have the third group, the late inoculators. And here we have fragile and conflict states, low income countries. And therefore this divergence is going to reflect also in the way economies are going to perform. Uh, uh, fast inoculators could get uh, um, between this year and next year, one additional percentage point of GDP in terms of growth. Uh, those who are late will suffer from that. Therefore, vaccine and the management of, of, of uh, the coronavirus are determined uh, in the way economies will exit the crisis and will recover. Next, please. And in the next slide, we see that uh, um, policy matters. Uh, last year, countries who have introduced policies were able, uh, as we see in the left side uh, chart, they were able to... Uh, reduce the magnitude of the contraction and um, exit and uh, recover faster. Therefore, policies matter. Last year, we saw fiscal monetary and uh, financial policies deployed by most of the countries. They did it fast in, in the first five months after the outbreak of the coronavirus shock. Most of the countries have introduced their policies. Yet, the size of fiscal space uh, has also determined the capacity of countries to provide stimulus. And um, the region in general was below what we saw in other emerging economies. The second is the nature of the economy determined also the way um, the crisis hit and the way to recover. Um, uh, tourism 
and uh, uh, contact intensive sectors suffered more. And countries where tourism is important in the structure of the GDP were more affected and the recovery is slow. Um, the third message, which is on uh, the um, uh, right hand chart is uh, the recovery is also differentiated. For example, retail, small companies, um, um, contact intensive sectors uh, were hit and their capacity to recover is slower. While manufacturing, for example, large companies were able to withstand the shock in a better way and including energies had the capacity to recover. Therefore, this is also going to determine the nature of the recovery and how um, the recovery will take shape. The third important issue is um, this has reflected in uh, the growth outlook. As we see here, in 2021, um, oil exporting countries were more affected because of the double whammy shock, as we see in the GCC in gray, or MENA oil exporter in yellow. Um, and we see that it has also dragged the non-oil sector, which is the dot. And therefore, their level of contraction was bigger than the EMs. For 2021, the recovery is faster because of the improvement in oil price and also because of the fast uh, measures uh, that were introduced, especially on fighting the COVID and increasing the inoculation. While uh, uh, oil importing countries, the EMs will grow slower than uh, the average emerging economies and developing countries in 2021. Uh, and broadly, the region will grow at 4% this year, coming from minus 3.6% uh, last year. 2022, the situation will improve, and I would say we'll see more no a normalization between countries, but yet we will not be at the level of other EMs. And I think this is very important um, to, to understand. The issue is the level of uncertainty, John, that we are still having around the outlook. The number of issues that could drag the outlook down are more present than the number of the issues or, or, or opportunities that could bring the outlook up. If we see tightening in the international financial markets, if we see a premature withdrawal of policies, and if we see a deterioration in terms of social stability, all these elements will bring the recovery down. And therefore, it's very important to, for policies to be, or policymakers to be very vigilant. Priority number one, is vaccine healthcare because this is what helps save lives and also protect livelihoods. And even if countries don't have fiscal space, reallocation within the same envelope of spending is a priority. Countries who can still accommodate uh, additional support, they should. They should at the same time target it and also make sure that gradually they are able to unwind it. And three is if this is the time to start building now the future and build a future that can bring growth back. Otherwise, it will be difficult for the countries to recover, uh, the countries in the region, especially those who have high level of unemployment, which I think is very important for that also to recognize which we, what we see in the next slide, that there are certain number of issues that existed before that were exacerbated with this crisis. We all know that uh, the majority of the emerging uh, markets in the region suffered at entering the crisis with low growth, high level of debt. The issue that we are uh, uh, highlighting in our outlook this year, that uh, this debt has increased and the big portion of the financing of this debt was done by local banks. Uh, this is not the case for all countries. In the case of all exporting countries and Sarah will tell us about Saudi, it was more diversified. International capital flows were um, stronger in coming back. But in other countries, the large portion of the financing came from local banks. And we've tried to test um, what will happen um, if things will not go as planned. And therefore, what we're seeing that the nexus between banks and the state is growing. This does not mean that the financial sector is at risk because banks are well capitalized. Their level of profitability is acceptable. And although we may see um, an increase in non-performing loans, but I would say the banking system is still solid. And last year uh, in our um, fall outlook, we did the stress testing 
that shows that although there will be vulnerabilities, but uh, the financial system is still holding. However, in order not to risk crowding out and allow the recovery to uh, you know, provide the needed support for SMEs, increase financial inclusion, we need to diversify investor base. And also we need to make sure that the fundamentals are strong for countries to be able to access new range of investors and to be able also to still access international capital markets that may be volatile or may witness a change in the uh, trends, both in interest and also in the liquidity. And this is something, John, you know more than anybody else, could, could be done very quickly. My last message um, um, is the medium term. And here, I want to benchmark with the global financial crisis. After the global financial crisis, many countries in the region felt that the crisis did not affect them as much as did affect the advanced economies. And they did not, as you said in your introduction, listen to what Churchill said, use a crisis as an opportunity. And they did not accelerate reforms. And we saw that gradually FDIs did not recover as it did in other EMs. We saw also that the growth was lacking and unemployment went up and um, the economies became more vulnerable. The risk is, as we see in the um, left-hand side uh, of the slide, the recovery could be slow and countries could not uh, regain the trend that they had pre-COVID uh, before a few years. And for example, uh, for fragile countries, it, they could not recover uh, the level of 2019 before 2023. Therefore, it's very important to start thinking today of how to accelerate the recovery. And this is, I think, what uh, we, uh, with Fadi uh, uh, on the call, uh, we will discuss is how technology, the silver linings that we saw during the crisis um, could uh, uh, be put uh, uh, to use in order to accelerate the recoveries. How those trends that accelerated during the pandemic can be, in fact, the locomotive of growth uh, next year. The other issue is this diversity could become an issue of great divergence. And this great divergence could create um, an, um, an issue within countries and also, and also between countries. We saw the vulnerability of the informal sector. We saw also the vulnerability of certain groups who don't have access to good quality infrastructure in order to use technology for education or for remittances uh, transfers or to for working remotely. And therefore, addressing this issue of divergence is going to be key. And Dr. Ibrahim, who has experienced this um, now at the ERF and when he was Minister of Finance in Sudan, could tell us you know, how this could translate into more challenging uh, uh, for uh, the societies and also for the overall stability. And our message to the region is um, work at the three levels, exit as fast as you can the crisis, uh, uh, solidify and strengthen the recovery and start from now building the future, building a better future. This would require certain number of uh, prerequisite, recognize that social is going to be important recognize that governance and fighting corruption is at the center of any new economic model and recognize that two thirds of the population of the region is below 30 or 35. And therefore, if we want to invest, we need to invest in sectors where those can thrive. And this is where technology, green, and um, uh, other type of startups, financial inclusion initiatives could help going forward. With that, maybe I will stop here for those who would like to read more, uh, I encourage them to go to uh, uh, our uh, update uh, uh, this spring that has many other uh, dimensions. And I look forward for, uh, I'm sure, a very interesting discussion. Over to you, John. Thank you very much. Uh, Jihad, I just have one quick follow-up, if I may, because this uh, just occurred to me as you were wrapping up and you talked about the great divergence, which I think is superb in terms of a policy um, prism that you're looking through right there. It's 10 years since the Arab Spring. And when we look back in two to three years and say the pandemic offered a great setback on job creation, uh, technology investment, 
and the inability to make the sustainable investment in terms of green technology. Is there a real danger there? You're hinting at this uh, potential downturn, but for the, for the poorer states, is, is there a crisis awaiting 10 years after the Arab Spring as a result of the fact that the pandemic provides that sort of fiscal shock to the system and the debt levels for some of the governments? Well, indeed. And of course, I think this is one of the key challenges. Uh, the issue, uh, one of the issues that maybe I did not cover is financing the recovery, especially for countries who are lacking fiscal space and they have huge need in terms of investment in infrastructure, in modern infrastructure, because otherwise they would not be able to recover fast. And this is where we think that cooperation and coordination uh, in the region is also one of the elements that emerged during the crisis. We start seeing that, for example, in the area of vaccine, there are some initiatives at the regional level. I think UAE has developed one in terms of logistics, in terms of providing support. Other countries on a bilateral basis are helping. We see a lot of solidarity. I think we need to translate the solidarity into a partnership. And the partnership now, in terms of regional cooperation, should not be the pyramidical one, the top-down, the political one, should be around priorities. I think the vaccination is one. Technology is another one. I'm sure that Fadi is much better than me in telling you that markets and size of the markets is one of the main issues to grow in the region. And if you keep you know, raising uh, the walls of regulations, it's very difficult to promote um, big markets and benefit from that. Therefore, it has to be around strategic place. Environment is another one. Um, water management, uh, electricity management, uh, many other issues, complementarity in terms of food security, which also was one of the important issues that we saw during the last 12 months, the importance of securing supply chains within uh, a remit uh, of, of, uh, of you know, closed neighborhoods. Therefore, I think, uh, yes, there is a role for coordination or regional cooperation. It should not replicate the old model. It can be driven by priorities. The role of the private sector should be in the lead. I think we need to rediscover the stakeholders uh, in any recovery. And the stakeholders in any recovery are the innovator, which means universities and you know, labs, are also the accelerator, which means people like Fadi and the investors, but also you need to have those who build franchise in the market, the financial institutions, as well as also all kind of, all type of, co uh, of corporations. Therefore, this partnership that needs to be built uh, and uh, in using a different framework. Okay, thanks very much for that, Jihad. Let's bring in uh, Sarah uh, Al-Suhaimi of the uh, Tadawal, uh, the Saudi Stock Exchange. And uh, Jihad talked about this briefly, uh, Sarah, as you know, about the volatility and the emerging markets able to have a buffer of their own here and the maturity of managing debt, for example, in the capital markets uh, because of the challenge of the global pandemic. Do you think that the MENA emerging markets have matured to a level that they can live through or withstand the volatility we see today? Thank you, John, uh, for the question. Actually, uh, Tadawal, uh, the Saudi Stock Exchange uh, name now is Saudi Tadawal Group, which was uh, just announced uh, last week. Uh, speaking of emerging markets, as you know, Saudi Arabia, uh, in Tadawal, we have joined uh, the uh, emerging market indices in the last two years uh, fully. And uh, what we have witnessed uh, through the pandemic, actually since from March uh, 2020 to March 21, an increase of 16% in the qualified foreign investors in Saudi Arabia as uh, uh, they continue to register. And they did play a role in the increase in volumes that happened during the last year. It was an extremely uh, challenging environment. As you know, Saudi Arabia has one of the fastest responses to uh, the pandemic, starting with freezing the uh, Umrah um, uh, visas uh, as early as February last year, I think, uh, if, it, if I'm correct. And uh, that was uh, the beginning uh, of what has been happening. 
um, six weeks down the road, we were uh, in complete curfew. And uh, we had to operate uh, the market in an environment where uh, volumes uh, not just doubled, tripled, quadrupled in some days. And we've done that uh, successfully. So I think the in general, the markets have matured. Uh, there are different uh, of differences in structures, of course, between um, you know the markets. However, the Saudi market is known to be the largest by far in the Middle East, where I think more than 60-70% of the uh, Arab markets uh, in, uh, in general. And we are uh, the third uh, largest emerging uh, market uh, in the world. Uh, in the indices and the the tenth uh, uh, the tenth of uh, global markets. So uh, I think we have uh, handled this uh, perfectly and swiftly, and uh, we're dealing with challenges as they come. This is not new. This uh, fast, uh, agile um, uh, response uh, started at the time uh, from the launch of Vision 2030. If you come to Saudi Arabia, uh, you can feel that uh, uh, things are very active here. And I think this has helped. And maybe later on, we can talk more about the response of Saudi Arabia uh, to COVID, which I think have, have a huge benefit in the increased trust of everybody living in Saudi Arabia to, with, to government decisions. Um, and, um, and basically minimizing the effect as much as possible uh, on the economy. Okay, great. Sir, if it's just a quick follow-up, if I may, there's this obsession with the 10-year bond in the United States and the level of stimulus uh, spending that we're seeing in America, also in Europe to a lesser degree. Uh, do you worry about inflation now and the impact this could have on Saudi Arabia as it goes through those Vision 2030 reforms, or do you don't see that feeding through the system uh, as of yet? The, the peg to the dollar uh, and uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, commitment to that uh, and the uh, uh, good monetary and fiscal policies here, um, we have um, you know, uh, maintained those uh, policies for so many years. Uh, so I think um, uh, things are under control in general. And uh, we have been increasing debt over the years. And as Jihad just mentioned, we actually were successful during the pandemic. Also, Saudi Arabia was, was successful to raise debt as well, uh, unlike many other uh, countries, foreign debt, I mean. Sure, perfect. Thanks. Let's bring in Dr. Uh, Al Badawi uh, joining us from uh, the DIFC uh, in Dubai today. I, I think I would be remiss if I don't circle back on the topic I brought up with Jihad uh, quickly there, uh, Dr. Ibrahim. And that is this danger of a two-speed MENA region. Uh, and I would think uh, Lebanon, Syria kind of jumped to the top of the list because they had a crisis before the pandemic hit. Uh, do you worry about the lower income or uh, conflict distressed states right now trying to recover out of the pandemic? And how do you size it up? How would you capture the spirit of what they're faced with right now uh, if you don't have the fiscal buffers I talked about in my opening uh, comments and what G had brought up in his presentation? Thank you, John, for the question. I think this is a very important uh, question because of it is uh, uh, implications for the entire region, not just for these countries. Uh, you know, basically, these countries had uh, have had more than fair share of the consequences of the pandemic uh, in terms of uh, the you know the limited capacity of the of the health uh, system. Uh, in addition to the extreme situation uh, you have a country some countries in conflict uh, you know ranging from libya to yemen uh, syria and and some countries even after a glorious revolution like sudan is still they have to grapple with the issue of peace building so just the basic idea of uh, power sharing and peace building is is a major concern now but uh, directly related to the pandemic is that uh, actually, even the projected recovery uh, by the by the by the regional economic outlook and other uh, you know uh, development institutions uh, for the Middle East is not likely to uh, uh, impact positively uh, this group of countries. This group of countries have already shrunk their economies by five percent and will continue uh, most likely to continue to deteriorate uh, even in 2021. Uh, it has a very limited fiscal space, and obviously, uh, in terms of indebtedness, uh, this and, and poverty—about three quarters of the population 
are classified in uh, fragile and conflict affected countries as uh, extremely poor. Uh, progress of about five years against poverty has been reversed by the pandemic in these countries. Mm. Nonetheless, of course, there are opportunities and, and, and ideas for uh, resolving uh, some of the extreme uh, uh, constraints facing them. For example, the G20 uh, debt suspension provided a temporary respite to these countries, but more could be done. The IMF, for example, uh, you know, expansion of SDRs and, uh, you, know, you know, motivating kind of rich countries to donate their SDRs to uh, these group of countries would be uh, an important contribution to enlarging the fiscal space, also expanding IDA uh, program by the, by the World Bank and other uh, development institutions. And then uh, also a multilateral uh, uh, grand bargain could be struck in order to uh, enhance uh, you know, financing, but then also transparency and accountability uh, of future debt, uh, and also uh, domestic resource mobilization. Because I think the IMF and the World Bank uh, and other you know, development institutions, regional like the Islamic Development Bank and the African, Develop uh, and the African Development Bank, as well as the uh, Arab Fund for Economic and Social Development, all of these could actually help these countries to build uh, and expand their fiscal space. Right now, fragility itself is actually a fiscal fragility. These countries, like my home country, Sudan, they only collect about 8% of the GDP. The IMA Fiscal, Depart uh, fiscal Affairs Department um, characterized countries that are unable or incapable to collect 15% uh, of GDP as uh, fiscally fragile states. So these are all uh, challenges, but I think they are possibilities uh, if multilateral approaches are developed uh, and some grand bargains are struck between the key uh, you know, uh, players uh, in the regional and international uh, scene. Okay, very quick follow-up if I may though. Are, is the rest of the world kind of overlooking the dangers of the spillover because of the pandemic and a country like, as you said, Syria, that's been wrapped with war for nearly a decade, uh, Libya, which is trying to rebuild and find peace, Lebanon, which sits on the edge of uh, uh, bankruptcy, and it seems to be a rolling problem. Uh, uh, this The spillover for the MENA region is quite great, uh, if you can weigh in on that, Dr. Ibrahim. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, actually, when you when you try to prosper in, a, in an otherwise conflictive and, uh, and unstable region, uh, certainly uh, economic research and policy experiences suggest that this will impact investment because uh, investors now are looking for, you know, broader supranational kind of factors to, uh, to influence their decisions. Uh, instability, sheer instability actually will draw, uh, you know, neighboring stable countries into, into conflicts uh, or into involvement into this, reduces global demand and uh, it has various consequences that I think a self-enlightened interest by the uh, otherwise safe and stable countries in the region is really to help uh, uh, resolve these conflicts and also to undertake a, a supranational approach. Because I think some of the problems uh, is that some countries have divergent, if not conflictive interest in resolving conflicts in Libya or in Yemen or uh, you know in Syria and, uh, and and even in Lebanon also and unless some sort of uh, uh, a multi-regional approach is developed in order to resolve these conflicts uh, it will be very difficult to succeed thank you for taking the follow-up question let's bring in the the private sector with uh, Fadi Gandur uh, who is Jordanian but uh, runs the Wamba group out of um, out of Dubai. And there's a couple of things I wanted to talk about, uh, Fadi. Number one, we've encouraged governments to, uh, to go into the services sector, to broaden employment through tourism, for example, uh, because of the youth employment challenges that, uh, that Dr. G had brought up. Uh, how are they surviving this if you, you don't have travel and the sort of impact it has on the private sector, which you watch very carefully? And then I'll circle back with you on what we can do on the technology side 
uh, to try to interrupt that and see if we can jumpstart growth. But let's start with the tourism sector for a place like uh, Jordan, uh, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt. It's been a heck of a pandemic, uh, clearly on that front. It's been a thank you, John. It's been it's been a, a, a big challenge, obviously. I mean, I wouldn't be revealing anything uh, uh, that nobody that people don't know is that uh, the very early days of the lockdown were the most painful, uh, effectively, when when every country had to lock down. But there was uh, much more flexibility as as countries went forward after May last year, I guess, so that they can create that flexibility to allow. Uh, not only for uh, for there, there's uh, for, for allowing for domestic tourism as a counterbalance as much as you can. I mean, Saudi Arabia, I'm hearing is is having a huge uh, domestic tourism. I know Jordan has had uh, also some good tourism going to uh, to Aqaba, but but the overall uh, international tourism flows. I mean, it's it's a global challenge, not only a regional uh, challenge as such. So. Uh, these countries had to uh, to contend with them. The, the the big issue with those, other than the than your usual uh, uh, hotels and the supporting groups, is the SMEs that were benefiting. You know, the restaurants, uh, the micro businesses, the uh, small retailers that were really most uh, affected uh, uh, by this. And uh, uh, here's where uh, uh, you know the fiscal uh, and the banking uh, sector having to step in to actually absorb uh, uh, some of, the, of these uh, shocks by either uh, giving uh, interest uh, uh, relief uh, or delay in payments. I mean, all of these uh, institutions through policy had had policy to actually help, uh, help these, uh, these people that were affected most. But by definition, uh, you know, countries that were dependent on tourism got hit. And when, when those uh, rebounded, uh, or try to as much as, as possible to rebound. Look at Dubai, for instance, as, as it eased up, as it opened up slowly, but surely you have a good uh, part of the tourism sector that has uh, effectively rebounded really at the end of the day. So uh, again, this is uh, a challenge that requires opening up. I mean, there is no way to get out of it unless the economies uh, and unless travel opens, opens up. And as Jihad was saying, uh, the vaccination, about immunization and people having the ability to actually uh, uh, start flying and start, uh, uh, start going from one place to another. Okay, I, your line's a little bit rough there, but I'm gonna try to do a follow-up. But what would you say to the international community? I'm quite shocked, actually, the cocooning that we see uh, taking place where people are not seeing the bigger picture. I know the UAE has set up a fund and is actually manufacturing uh, vaccines in the near future. Uh, but what would you say to the rest of the globe that's not, uh, collectively trying to deal with the vaccinations in the poor countries uh, around the world in, in the influence it has on the private sector to reset, which is a major theme of our conversation, Fadi. Well, look, uh, John, I mean, I, I think this pandemic thing is a global issue and it affects everyone. So if, if, if emerging markets or if poorer countries are unable to uh, get their immunization and their vaccination, then, then you're, you're going to hinder uh, a good chunk of even the developed markets and the more uh, evolved markets in the vaccination because at the end of the day, uh, if one big country, look at Brazil, for instance, if, it, if, if, uh, if one big country is unable to immunize itself and vaccinate, vaccinate itself, then it's going to affect even the developed markets. So partial lockdowns, uh, partial bans on travel. Uh, I mean, again, uh, uh, this is like uh, global warming. Uh, uh, it affects everyone, and there needs to be a, a global uh, a global response to it. And and these countries that are able have to step up and and actually uh, make these vaccinations available in the countries that were not able to to actually get them in uh, quickly enough. Good and jihad, and, and I'll bring Sarah into the conversation as well. But let's go with you've talked about this idea of having inclusive uh, growth, jihad. What has the pandemic done? to derail that effort to make sure that the poor of society, the youth of society are not locked out. Do, would you say in the MENA region, they had an eye on the, the challenge here to the youth because there was this youth unemployment challenge in the Middle East and North Africa to begin with, uh, which we are not uncovering here fully uh, because many of the markets are still closed. How do you make it inclusive then in the next wave here? Well, uh, this was a priority for the region over the last decade. And we at the fund, as you recall, John, we have been working on this uh, with uh, countries, communities over the last uh, 10 years or so. 
The crisis has unfortunately exacerbated that. Let me take a few examples. The level of unemployment in country like Jordan reached now 24, 25%. In country like Tunisia, 18%. When you take at the youth level, for example, in Jordan is 55%. The challenge that we saw also is informal sector uh, that enjoyed in the past uh, uh, certain flexibility suffered more than the formal sector. And this is due to the fact that the various um, fiscal programs were not able to access easily those. Some countries, in fact, Innovated, take the case of Morocco, they were able to provide through mobile phones direct support to 5 million families. And this is, I think, was um, one of the examples how we could plan um, the recovery going forward. The youth and women were the most affected because their ability to work remotely with the challenges is um, less than others. And therefore, yes. Going forward, social is going to be important. No recovery without strong social pillar. What does it mean? It means that in addition to um, social protection or addressing issues of vulnerabilities, you need to build strong education system whereby you can provide good quality education to all strata of the population. You need to have a good health system that protects, but also immunizes. Uh, people um, from all kinds of viruses and disease. Therefore, we need a strong pillar. We need also a strong uh, labor pillar. And I'm happy to see two developments. One, that remittances held well during the crisis. And we saw technology helping here in accelerating mm. the utilization of mobile transfer, reduction of cost. I think it was extremely beneficial because it's a lifeline in different countries. In Sudan, for example, I think it represents a double digit in terms of GDP. Therefore, it's very important. The second thing that we saw also during this crisis that is important is we saw government innovating, developing new uh, social programs. And when we look into what government did during the first five or six months after the pandemic, Exactly, they focused on addressing income. And, um, um, and also, uh, we saw in a, a very useful development in the GCC, for example, uh, providing more flexibility to the labor market, allowed women in Saudi to be um, have greater access to labor market, which will bring productivity in itself. Also for, um, for foreign laborers with the capacity to move from one job to another, this is an important step. For decades, this was a real issue. I see those initiatives uh, helping in the recovery. Yet, I think what is going to be strategic is two thirds of the population is below 30, 35. If we don't find through the private sector, the capacity to create jobs, it's impossible for the state to step up more what the SOEs can develop. Uh, as job opportunities, especially that one of the weaknesses at the macro level was SOEs in the region, because they don't have the same agility and flexibility as the private sector. And therefore, they will not be able to provide the needed jobs in the future. When I say this, it doesn't mean it, that it has to be large or small. It has to be every private company. And financial inclusion matters. Um, addressing the scarring by reskilling uh, people, because there are sectors or activities where at least for the next five years, we will be in the low cycle. We need to reutilize this labor. Before, we need now to take a direction. We are at a crossroad. We need to take a direction. There is one direction that is easy, is to wait, but it's really not the right direction. And there is one direction that is difficult, but this is the right one, is to accelerate reforms, take risks today, and do it rightly. I was very happy to see, for example, Sarah mentioned it, that in Saudi, um, they were able to reduce the number of cases from 5,000 to a few hundreds in three months. And at the same time, they introduced fiscal measures in order to make sure that their public finance is under control and accelerate investment in certain few future industries, like an environment. Therefore, this is a defining moment, and it's a moment where waiting will be much more costly than taking initiatives.
Very interesting. Sarah, let me bring you in here. And I, I'm going to deviate and bring up something that I've saw in the last couple of weeks as a trend. And that is uh, the IMF. And I've, I think this is the 10th one I've chaired uh, on the regional economic outlook over the last decade. It's been very interesting to try to foster competition. So one message here is collaboration. Think bigger, think about the region because of the challenge of inoculations and, and the rest. But the other side of it, we see emerging from Saudi Arabia saying, look, we want to be a hub for foreign direct investment. We've put out some real stretch targets. We're using state-owned enterprises like Aramco and Sabek to serve as public-private partners uh, in the private sector here. This is very different thinking than we would have seen in Saudi Arabia even one year ago. What impact can it have on attracting that sort of investment and attracting Saudi capital back into the Saudi market, which has been dispersed to Europe, the United States, as you know, uh, and other parts of the Middle East, Sarah? I think um, a lot, you know, as mentioned many times today, the fast response was very important. And uh, actually, you know, we went through a huge learning experience when we started implementing Vision 2030. And there is a learning curve. Um, I think the government was a little bit ahead of the private sector in realizing the problem putting the plan down and actually starting to execute. Private sector took a little time to understand what's going on. But I think many of many of the private companies already started moving uh, uh, in that direction. You can see that we actually never really stopped. You can see that sometimes when there were some you know, decisions that were made that uh, immediately showed that uh, we just took a wrong direction, the government corrected itself. You can see the response to COVID and what the government did early on, whether, as I mentioned before, stopping the visas for Umrah is a very big decision for Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, not just because of religious reasons, it's also because of economic reasons. It's one of the, uh, of the revenues that comes to the country uh, through religious tourism. As we know that Saudi Arabia has opened for tourism uh, this year, as rightly mentioned by one of the panelists, and I think it's Fadi, the uh, local tourism actually boomed after uh, during the pandemic. And this helps a lot of SMEs, a lot of micro businesses, not just in the main cities, in other cities. And this is one of the most important things. When the private companies see that the government was fast, they implemented, they gave packages, uh, they took care of the SMEs, uh, they actually put uh, our health first, uh, technology served us a lot. I think all the investment that the Saudi government made in making all the services uh, through uh, available through applications or online helped not stopping so many things during the pandemic. Uh, this this also spilled over into private companies. So I think that uh, the uh, the fast or the pace where PPP will happen will be much faster. Uh, going forward, I think this was an opportunity actually for us to make many decisions that a lot of people were uh, hesitant about. And um, I think we really never stopped. Last year, if I take, for example, the Saudi Stock Exchange, we listed eight companies. We actually listed uh, a company uh, during the full curfew. Uh, time and uh, we did the whole roadshow and I was actually also at the time the CEO of the investment bank leading this uh, IPO we did everything virtual all the investor meetings and everything we listed two other companies that actually also had uh, some um, uh, international invest investment in and this year pipeline is uh, is uh, huge. Last year we it was eight. The years before it was much less. This year, just now, we have thirty maybe um, listings waiting for approval. Um, activity was not just in the main market. Uh, back in 2017, we launched the uh, SME market. We call it Numu, where we can list SMEs. And as as you know, that this is uh, this is an initiative in helping SMEs and uh, helping regulate SMEs and helping empowering SMEs is one of the major. Uh, uh, initiatives of the government. So back in 2017, when I first uh, joined the stock exchange, a lot of people had so many doubts about this market. Why are you doing this parallel market? Who is going to come and list? 
And actually now it's one, it, it has a very good successful story. It took time, but uh, companies started listing. Some of them actually moved to the uh, main market. We just saw last week an approval for three, I think, or four companies coming uh, also in. We started also listing debt. Um, and uh, we are now uh, working on uh, getting into the international debt indices as well as we did for equity. This activity, uh, and I'm using um, Tadawil as the company I am involved with as an example, happens in each and every company, whether state owned or other, because even other companies that does not have uh, government ownership competes with companies that can have partial or for uh, government ownership. And this helped things moving on. Uh, the road is not easy. There are roadblocks. Uh, things were not uh, very smooth all the time. But the one thing I was surprised in when I first came into this, you know, till now I am private sector. I'm not a, a government employee. Uh, I am uh, I'm the head of a, co a company that is today owned by government, which, by the way, we're going to list uh, by end of the year. So that also proves the the uh, uh, the uh, privatization program that the PIF and the government have. Um, uh, I was very pleased to see the amount of collaboration between many different government institutions. And I think this was the difference than what has been happening uh, a decade ago, let's say. <clears throat> Because okay. everybody knows what we're working on. So okay. in a nutshell, things are moving. Okay, thank you very much for that. I appreciate the uh, uh, contribution there, Sarah. We have some questions coming to the floor. I just want to remind our audience that we're using the hashtag IMFMENA. There's a chat box on the bottom of the screen if you're watching us on Zoom and we're taking those questions as well. Uh, we have a question uh, from Wasim Mina, the associate professor at the UAE University here. Uh, in the United Arab Emirates. How does the IMF's Middle East and Central Asian Department think about uh, reforming welfare systems? And, and I think this would be something for you, Jihad, and then also have Ibrahim weigh in. Jihad, your microphone's uh, muted at this stage. Uh, but can you tackle welfare reform uh, coming out of a pandemic and how vital is it? And Ibrahim, jump in, and then I'm gonna bring in Fadi on technology. Thanks. Uh, thanks, John. Um, I mentioned a um, few minutes ago the importance of social. Uh, and social is, um, uh, has different, uh, uh, I would say different pillars here. Um, one is you need um, uh, that the social protection system to provide protection to people irrelevant of their employer. Uh, currently in many countries of the region, uh, public sector provides uh, 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 a good coverage compared to what uh, those who are in the informal sector or self-employed or private sector could have. Uh, in developed economies, and, and also this will have a, an economic benefit uh, because it will increase mobility of, of labor, is to move this social protection from the nature of the provider, public or private, to the citizens themselves. Second, the new welfare state is a welfare state that invests in what people need for them to thrive. I think education is going to be the big avenue of investment going forward. And I see a multiple initiatives here at using more technology. I'm sure that uh, with the last two years, uh, uh, especially the last year and a half, we saw a lot of uh, potential of improving how technology can ha could help. Take only the example of Arabizing or teaching in Arabic and how technology could help in that. Medical, we saw that huge developments, you know, um, virtual um, doctors, um, um, uh, robots, etc. But I also, I see that universities can collaborate more. Uh, if I compare with Europe, uh, with Erasmus, or even in the US or globally, there is still way to go on that. Therefore, I think we need to redesign social. Let me take a few examples here. I think Morocco has launched a broad base consultation around what is the new social protection, the social model. And I think I encourage many countries to do so. We did recently a study on social spending that is showing that social spending in the region is relatively low, where the region is suffering still from high level of public expenditures. Therefore, we need to reallocate more spending to social, and we need to redesign the way 
public finance management is being done. This is maybe a plumbery, but this is something very important. Reducing the gaps would require also a more proactive way of uh, bringing down the differential between high income and low income people. And this may require a, a courageous tax reforms in order to reduce those gaps, especially in countries where government resources are limited. Yes, is very important. Three, I think what is also important is improve access to finance. This region has good banking system, has ample liquidity, and yet when you compare, the level of financial inclusion does not exceed five, six percent. On average in EMs, it's 16 percent. This region has wealth of potential with the women of this region and not using their potential that could provide more than one trillion dollar in the next 10 years. Mm. Therefore, I think it's the time to go back to some of the old ideas that are still valid. And those ideas, their time has come today um, after this crisis. Last point, I want to um, uh, comment on what Sarah was saying. Sarah was insisting on saying, I am a private company. It's very interesting. We are seeing a, 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 usually a public function that in most of the countries, people want it to be state-owned, regulated. She wants to promote this as, as private company in order to say it has to work on a corporate basis. And I think this is something that is very important. And we need to expand this, not only because of this is the way to modernize the state, but in the case of debt, the region need $1.2 trillion of financing in the next two years. The risk of crowding out is high. I would very much like to see that in Tadawan, also government bonds of the region are listed and Sarah can, uh, and can sell those to investors. And therefore we can deepen and increase the liquidity of, of, of the markets and reduce the risk. Therefore, this is where uh, I think we are at, at, at an important turning point and we should not focus only on, on the immediate issues. Um, and with, with changing a, a bit the paradigm of the way we think, we as an institution, as a fund, we can help. We can help not only financially, this is what we're doing, but we can also help technically. Um, Dr. Ibrahim was mentioning that fiscal affairs department can provide a lot of support on that. We can also provide on other areas. Therefore, I think this is a time for transformation. Okay, very good. Speaking of transformation, I'd love to get Fadi's views and then I'll go to Ibrahim on another question we have from the floor. And we have questions come in, which we appreciate. So um, that uh, effectiveness of using the hashtag IMF MENA, both on, um, on uh, the different platforms that we're using today, including LinkedIn uh, is feeding through. So thanks and I'll circle back because we have exactly 30 minutes left. How would you rate uh, Fadi the resilience of the technology sector. You know, this has been a special pandemic where the likes of Amazon or Alibaba and uh, the distribution hubs that we've seen here in the UAE, for example, kind of rise to the occasion. Did they have the resilience you were expecting as startups to survive uh, what is a once in a lifetime, once in a hundred year challenge? Yeah, absolutely, uh, John. I think, uh, I think the digitalization uh, challenge in the region arose and whatever we were thinking would happen the next 10 years actually shrunk and, and happened in, in the pandemic. So uh, whoever did not digitize felt the pain. And there was, there has been uh, a boom in the startup uh, ecosystem. I would say, you know, there's a silver lining in, in the pandemic story is that finally the digital landscape became a, a legitimate asset class for people to invest in, for people to realize that you cannot, governments, private sector, big corporations that were not ready for it uh, uh, realized finally that this, this needed to happen. And only, not only were they resilient, the problem they had is actually meeting demand rather than only resilience. So uh, the, there was there was supply uh, supply chain challenges, the ability to uh, actually uh, uh, deliver on the demand of the consumers. So that side of the story is actually, in my view, uh, what we're going to see in the uh, next 10 to 20 years in building uh, the parallel non-oil-based economies of the region. So the digital landscape is happening. Look at what happened to education. So when you know, people were talking about distance, uh, distant learning uh, will happen you know, sometime in the future. Can you imagine a school today or a university today telling you this is happening in the future? I mean, so 
uh, you, we are seeing so much more money coming into it also. Uh, uh, let me, uh, you know, we've done some research at, at Wanda. So last year, there was a, a billion dollars invested in the startup ecosystem in MENA. The first quarter of this year, which we just published, we, there was 400 million of, of, uh, of fresh money invested in uh, the startup uh, ecosystem. It's not enough, you know, you need to do much more, but this is a massive change. This is a different mm. story from what we've heard in the past hour, right? So in the past hour, we were talking about the challenges. Now I'm telling you that what happened in the pandemic was actually a big opportunity. The, uh, the sovereign wealth funds, are the PIF uh, are of Saudi Arabia has seeded about 15 to 20 venture capital funds in Saudi Arabia today. There were none two years ago. So, mm. uh, and again, this is an understanding that you need to have access to capital so that these very early stage companies actually come and build the next generation of, of companies in the region and build the ability of the region to become digital and, and catch up to the rest of the world. In my view, this, uh, 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 you know, it's very difficult to say that there's a good, um, uh, there's a good story in the pandemic. But yes, there was that was uh, that has been a, a good story in the pandemic. One very important thing that has happened also in the pandemic is that the regulators finally wanted to start talking and talking very uh, seriously to these startups so that they can find ways to regulate. I'll give you an example. During the lockdown, Saudi Arabia decided that. Uh, in e-commerce, you cannot receive cash. You know, this is a cash on delivery uh, market. 80% of e-commerce happens in the region, cash on delivery. So what happened? Suddenly, everybody had to pay digitally. So whatever we were hoping would happen in 10 years, suddenly happened in two months. And who did that? The regulators felt that they were caught off guard with this. And so they had to move so out of their comfort zone to actually make it available for these companies to to meet the demand of the marketplace and the, cha the, the very fast changing marketplace. So I am, look, I am extremely optimistic about this. Even the venture, even corporations today, uh, the traditional corporates in the region have corporate VCs now. You know, a, a, six months ago, I didn't hear of corporate VCs. Now I have friends who run some of the biggest conglomerate co uh, family uh, uh, companies in the region would call me and say, Fadi, we're setting up a corporate VC because we want to invest in, in startups. We want to invest in companies that are disrupting our own businesses. Look at the banks. Look at how the banks are opening up to the fintech companies so that they provide their licensing uh, and their ability to give them that, uh, that uh, regulatory umbrella so that they can uh, meet also the, the, the demand of the marketplace. So, uh, uh, and finally, the digital landscape, uh, uh, John, the, the big uh, high net worth uh, family offices in the region finally think that startups are an asset class to invest in. So I think uh, it, it, I am seeing now a big shift, but I think in the coming two or three years, you're gonna see a, a quantum leap a quantum leap in the digital landscape in the region. And I think even, you know, the, the challenge is, is, is the digitized versus the non-digitized countries. So the, the poorer and less poor, but I think in the digital landscape, there is a bit more of parity and you can actually impact a country like Jordan, uh, a country like Egypt uh, uh, very quickly once you uh, deploy capital in them for the startup ecosystem and create the, the technology jobs that you were talking about earlier. So the youth, how are you gonna employ the youth? You can't only employ them in 20th century jobs. You have to employ them in 21st century jobs. And thus the education system has to catch up to the demand of the private sector, the new demands of the private sector that were not happening in the past. So, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, this is a space to watch and to watch very carefully and to actually uh, double down on the deployment of capital, because that's where the, uh, you know, you look at China and that's where China is. And if China is there, then we have to move in that direction. Okay, very good. Very interesting uh, discussion here. Another question for the floor. I'm gonna give this one to Dr. Ibrahim and if uh, Jihad wants to jump in, it'd be good as well. The IMF is um, uh, in the policy debate about a global uh, solidarity tax. Uh, again, this is a question coming from the UAE. Uh, and I could see it, Ibrahim, gathering momentum within the OECD and the same effort that the U.S. tried to lead on money laundering, which was successful tightening uh, the ability of states and, and some uh, state actors or private sector actors to, to do money laundering. Uh, that's a pretty bold initiative. Can it gather momentum, Ibrahim? And then Jihad, jump in if you can. 
Well, I don't seem quite understand the, this is a talking about solidarity in terms of uh, containing money laundering or what is it? No, no, no. I was saying the, the, the US used the OECD to tackle money laundering, as you know, as an initiative 10 years ago. Many were doubtful when they started that initiative. Now we have the IMF, uh, Janet Yellen, talking about a global solidarity tax uh, to have a global corporate tax of 28%. It seems ambitious. Uh, do you see the, the MENA region moving in this direction as well? We have uh, a level playing field when it comes to the corporate tax sector. Is it a wise idea at this stage? Well, I don't really have, uh, you know, uh, sufficient background on this to assess, but I think uh, the MENA region uh, obviously uh, need actually to consider fairies building the kind of uh, fiscal system and uh, fiscal space uh, to deal with the immediate issues that it's facing. Uh, and I'm not so sure really, uh, this is probably an issue that probably finance people, people in the banking sector might be able to address. But uh, I, I would think that any viable global initiative that uh, will actually add value to the accountability and transparency uh, that will actually you know, kind of contain uh, illicit activities, uh, uh, certainly I think would be a win-win situation for everybody. But the extent to which the MENA region is ready or willing to be involved, uh, this is something to be assessed, I guess. Okay, thanks, Ray Ibrahim, for that. Uh, Jihad, let's get you to weigh in. These are pretty bold initiatives, with, but when the U.S. kind of puts its weight behind it as the number one economy, uh, there seems to be movement. Uh, and momentum. What, what do you think about this idea of a global solidarity tax? I noticed when the the German solidarity or unification tax came in, it never phased away. It, it lowered, but it has been around for three decades after the fall of the Berlin Wall. John, I think the debate on fiscal policy is uh, one uh, uh, important dimension to open. And tax system usually is, is different. I think uh, even if you take Europe, tax system, especially income tax system, is national. But there are certain issues in the region that you can still address. Uh, our tax system in the region still have uh, inefficiencies and loopholes in terms of special schemes, in terms of narrow tax base that could benefit uh, by modernizing it, by eliminating some of those um, inefficient uh, uh, systems that exist in, uh, in, in, our, uh, in our tax framework that could be modernized. This is one. Second, there is also tax administration that is very important to modernize. Uh, Fadi was talking about technology. If you look at the technology that exists today in the industry of trade and transport, it's, it's you know, futuristic. And when you look at the customs and tax administrations in the region, they are still working on paper. And here you can increase efficiency, uh, provide a great support to the private sector by reducing the time that you spend in those transactions and increase the level of revenues. And more importantly, increase transparency. I think this also is an important dimension. People want to know where their money went. People want to know that if they pay tax, others are paying taxes. And people want to know that this money is being well utilized. And therefore, to be well utilized going forward, it has to go on social um, uh, spending, it has to go on infrastructure spending and less on keeping the current expenditures. There is an issue of divergence in terms of income in this in the region. And this could be addressed, but I think there are um, uh, several issues to be, to be tackled. The only element that I would uh, see as an important uh, here is not to open any subject or uh, not to allow at least the discussion on all the subject. In the past, we had certain number of taboos. Take, for example, the gasoline subsidy or the energy subsidy. For decades, it was a taboo. It, it depleted resources and it costed governments a huge amount of fiscal space. When reformed, it proved to be useful. It proved also to help government to gain additional fiscal space redirected to those who need it. Therefore, I think what is important at this stage is open up all the subjects, let's discuss, 
see what is fitting, and how to sequence it. I think what is going to be important, uh, John, is the sequencing. Because if you accelerate uh, uh, some of those transformations, you could maybe um, have an impact on the recovery. Therefore, it's a weighing exercise. You need to weigh how fast you could go and you know, uh, and uh, uh, how wide you, uh, you should go. But I would very much encourage countries in the region not to close the discussion on any subject currently. Yeah, it's a great, you know, it's interesting with the conversation that all four of you brought up and particularly Fadi with the startup uh, culture, nobody thought the capital for the, the family trading groups would go into that or that the state owned enterprises would have a VC uh, component is a radical change here. And as you said, nobody ever thought you'd touch the energy subsidies and it actually happened. So there is evolution that's uh, taking place. I wanted to touch on Fadi really quickly on a, a topic that's been quite hot when the Americans look at a global corporate tax of 28%, Fadi, and they're targeting the Amazons of the world or an Apple or a Google, parking money in tax havens or more uh, cost competitive uh, countries like Ireland, Singapore, Hong Kong. Is this gonna uh, kill growth in your view in the technology sector if we're not careful? Uh, is it overreached by the Americans in your view, Fadi? Well, I think there should be a, a very serious and deep dialogue with, with, with these corporations on, on why they're doing what they're doing. And, and so that there is a, a, a solution that comes from the private and the public sector rather than the public sector coming in and saying, well, here's what, what you've been doing. The world has allowed them to do that. You can't blame them for doing it. So, uh, but there needs to be a much more serious dialogue. I, do, I don't think there is going to be a very serious effect on growth, but what is going to happen is it will probably, uh, uh, you need to find a way so that these companies do not get affected in how they invest on, on the global level. They're all used to taxes. So, I mean, it's not Amazon, it's not as if it's not used to taxes, nor, nor Apple, but, but these, you, uh, they're called loopholes, but they're not really loopholes. They are, they are countries and they are uh, uh, <laughs> regulatory environments that allow these people to actually conduct their business the way they're doing. So there needs to be a global dialogue around it that has the public sector, the private sector at the table. It's not only a public sector discussion. Okay, thanks very much on this. There's another question that came in uh, via the, uh, the chat box here. And this one came in from LinkedIn and we have 15 minutes left uh, on the hashtag IMF Mina if you wanna uh, put some more questions in. Uh, this one is for you, Jihad, and I'll try to uh, see if I can streamline it from Paul Kaladajian uh, of Competitor Intelligence. Uh, he said that according to the Wall Street Journal, the world's poorest countries will get fewer than 10% of the new allocation of SDRs Special dollars for dictators. It was a Wall Street Journal uh, column on March 25th. Uh, can you comment on that? Are they being more discerning about where this money is going from uh, and to? And you talked about transparency. Is this part of the process, Jihad? Well, John, as you know, uh, the SDRs, which is the unity of count for the IMF, uh, is based on the membership and the share of each member uh, in in so-called the capital of the fund, and therefore it, ha it is linked to the size of each economy. But let me say two things related to the region. One is the fund has stepped up its operation last year and provided $17 billion uh, in terms of financing that went to countries who needed uh, these resources to address the COVID, but also address economic stabilization. The use of SDRs this year would be an additional um, um, support that could help countries in the region, especially with the risk of volatility in, in interest rate or in capital flows, uh, to get at least a cushion in terms of financial resources. This is one. Two, we are encouraging countries to trade and to allow uh, countries to be able to lend or to provide their SDRs, those who don't need them, to others who need it. Therefore, this will strengthen also the partnership the regional partnership and international partnership between uh, advanced economies and low-income countries. Um, and this would complement uh, the various initiatives that were done. For example, we're providing grants to low-income countries and the G20 last year with the Saudi chairmanship developed uh, the DSSI, the Debt uh, uh, Sustainability Initiative that helped countries who have issues uh, with their 
repayment of debt to address this issue because of, of the crisis. Therefore, there is an international solidarity. We could develop a regional solidarity in terms of the use of SDRs. And we can link this to a greater, I would say, partnership. On the last one, yes, as we did for the uh, rapid finance uh, financial initiatives, uh, the initiative uh, of $100 billion to uh, address um, um, uh, the COVID-19 crisis, we will have um, a very clear framework um, that uh, address all issues related to the transparency uh, and the traceability of how these funds are used. Okay, a quick follow-up if I may, Jihad, and we saw uh, a political question take place, of course, of the ruling family in Jordan, but I wanted to put it in a different context. I mean, Jordan's been a buffer against ISIS. It's had the influx of Palestinians and Iraqis, uh, and it's under strain financially, fiscally. It doesn't have the oil and gas revenues that we see, for example, in the GCC. How does this play into the strains that we see uh, uh, for the leadership? Are, are people kind of taking Jordan for granted in this sort of environment that it, because it served this role as a political military buffer that we don't need to watch its fiscal challenges and the neighborhood in which it, in which it sits? And this bubbled up even in the, in the ruling and royal family there. Well, John, there are several countries in the region because of the conflict situation. You have uh, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Egypt, and maybe other countries who are hosting a large number of refugees. We have 26 million or 25 million internally displaced and refugees in the region. And then we need to also recognize countries who are providing support to those. Uh, Jordan is providing support to 1.3 million Syrian refugees in addition to the other waves. Jordan has been trying to tackle the issues that emerged, especially after what has happened over the last 10 years and where the whole uh, trade uh, and movement of goods and services and people was disrupted. Uh, recently, last year, Jordan has uh, developed uh, a reform strategy that we supported with an IMF program that had two objectives, maintain stability in the macro economy and address the debt issue because the debt is high, but also to ignite the economy. And the priorities were on how to reduce the cost of labor and reform social security, how to reduce the cost of energy. And this is why they invested heavily on uh, reforming the energy sector, how also to improve business environment and increase transparency. Uh, including in tackling the issue of loopholes in the tax system, tax avoidance, and tax evasion. And they have done over the last year, despite the challenge of the coronavirus, they have done um, progress on that. For example, we finished the, the review, the second review of the program at, st at staff level uh, two weeks ago. And then in terms of what we call the quantitative targets, they were met despite uh, that Jordan is facing the second wave of a coronavirus shock, and also in terms of structural reforms. And we allowed some flexibility in the program and we augmented it by 200 million to address that. Of course, um, Jordan needs higher level of growth and therefore further structural reforms will be needed in order to provide um, uh, more room for the private sector to thrive and grow uh, by increasing the productivity in the economy. Jordan also, because of the level of debt, needs to keep a very strong eye on that. Um, but also, at the same time, we saw the central bank and the Ministry of Finance introducing certain number of good measures to combat um, the pandemic and to provide support to the livelihood. Of course, um, um, when the level of unemployment is high, it's a challenging issue and it's a balancing act that you need to, uh, to find. Okay. Uh, do you want to weigh in on this, Fadi? Because you, you're Jordanian by birth. You do your businesses in Dubai here. You know, is the world not seeing the vulnerability that Jordan has because of where it's positioned right now? And despite all the reforms that Jihad was talking about, it struggles with the population with youth unemployment? I mean, there's no magic wand here, but what, what are your suggestions? My suggestions is that, yes, there is no magic wand here. And people need to remember very, very clearly that, you know, at least 30 to 40 percent of the population now comes either uh, from, from the surrounding countries and specifically from, uh, from Syria. So a country li like Jordan with, with really relatively 
uh, no natural resources is carrying a very, very heavy burden. So whenever you want to think about Jordan, think about the stability of Jordan, you need to think about how much weight it is carrying uh, for the region. I mean, you talked about it as a buffer. And so being a buffer requires that it's buttressed at all times from the people that feel that it is an important buffer uh, in there. So you need to invest in the country and you need to make sure that it continues to be stable so that it, it uh, continues to play the positive and the, uh, uh, the, the role that it has played uh, historically. So I'm, you know, being, I'm, 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 I'm working in certain committees that help some of the challenges on, of unemployment. So I'll give you uh, uh, very quickly uh, a bit of a statistic. There is a huge number in Jordan of what we call the daily wage earners. I mean, these are the people that if they don't work one day, they're not able to provide food on the table. And so you need to come out and actually create that uh, uh, economic uh, uh, support for these individuals. And they're, they're quite, uh, quite a high number I mean, uh, uh, of people. Without doing that, you're going you're gonna to have people that are probably uh, uh, disgruntled. And the international community needs to step up to make sure that the, the country continues to play uh, the role uh, it is playing and stay stable uh, as we all uh, want it to be. Okay, thanks very much for that. Uh, we have about uh, six, seven minutes uh, left, but I wanted to bring up this and finish on this spirit of uh, competition within the region. I, I, I find that you would have a, a leading state like the UAE serve as a kind of a hub for foreign direct investment, whether it's financial services, and we talked about the DIFC, whether it's trade ports, whether the airline connections. Uh, Sarah, it, it's interesting what Saudi Arabia is saying now. They want regional companies to set up shop in Saudi Arabia. It's the largest economy in the region. Egypt's been moving aggressively to with the scale of the consumer market, as you know, Dr. Ibrahim as well, uh, to get its fair share. Would you put this under the classification of healthy competition? So there's collaboration somewhere, but you know, they're not hiding the fact we want to compete. We want our fair share of FDI. Let's go with Sarah and Ibrahim, and then I'll ask Jihad for last words. Thanks. Thank you, John. Yes, for sure. We were, I think uh, Saudi Arabia was uh, very clear in their uh, vision and objective of uh, competing. Uh, Akid, it, uh, for sure, it's a healthy competition. First, uh, they mentioned uh, our geographic location and that they want to invest more uh, in connecting uh, the east to the west. Uh, we have uh, we uh, we are the only Arab country in the G20 com countries. We are one of the largest economies uh, in the region. Uh, our population, even in comparison to our GCC uh, countries, is uh, f by far larger. So uh, we have a lot of potential. We have the youth. We have the education system. Uh, we have the investment uh, that we have been doing in their education over the last few years. And uh, now we have a plan. And um, we have many untapped territories. One of them was tourism. Tourism was almost zero a few years ago. Today, uh, we are open. There are tourist visas that people can be given. And there is a big, uh, uh, there are uh, many opportunities and many options to visit in Saudi Arabia. And as you can see, we can do all those you know, investments. And I think this will also encourage uh, foreign direct investment once people actually come and see what uh, they can uh, invest in. And uh, we have uh, seen a lot of uh, early on uh, responses uh, for these. We, um, uh, a lot of untapped uh, investment opportunities in entertainment, for example. Um, uh, women just having the social reforms that Saudi Arabia have done over the last five years changed the mood in the country completely. This is something I can say as a citizen of Saudi Arabia and um, anybody who's familiar with Saudi, if you visited a few years ago, visit now, you can see this change on the ground. Uh, and we were actually ready for it. It just happened and, you know, People, uh, the response that people spent decades uh, discussing didn't, you know, there was no, you know, a significant neg negative response. On the contrary, I see that this uh, unlocked a huge potential. So uh, we have all the reasons to compete. And I, of course, did not cover everything, uh, you know, but uh, I think uh, competition is healthy. And yes, we are here. Uh, the His Royal Highness, the Prince, did say it a few years back. Uh, we we took our time, and we don't have time to actually uh, uh, improve and uh, to prove uh, to the world that we can be 
uh, one of uh, its uh, leaders. One very good example is the uh, strategy for Riyadh as a capital uh, city. This was this, and we can actually see it happening on ground. I live in Riyadh. I can see uh, what is happening, and I can see how serious the government is in making it one of the uh, top ten cities in the world. And I think we're going to reach that. So yes, we want to compete, and we're here. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, yeah, going from eight million to seventeen million is the target. If uh, people haven't tuned in to what's going on in Riyadh, uh, we've all been there uh, as of late. You almost don't recognize it as you were suggesting, Sarah. Uh, Ibrahim, I'm going to answer a little bit tighter answers, and I want to I'll give uh, Jihad the last word here. How do you view this competition? Uh, some get intimidated by the largest economy looking to be quite aggressive and get its fair share of foreign direct investment. Is it healthy for the region, uh, Dr. Ibrahim? Uh, I think I agree with Sarah that it doesn't have to be a, a negative sum game. It could be actually a positive sum game. But I would actually urge that the frontier should not be just uh, within the GCC. Because actually, post-COVID-19, uh, success requires a much more involved role for the state uh, in a new style and also for uh, the private sector, the business community, and the local colleges and universities. Uh, I think uh, what we really need is development corridors anchored on productive cities. And uh, this would require actually at least, I wouldn't be able to say it all, but five levels of productivity. Uh, one at the level of the firm, so that actually you bring uh, workers together and avoid uh, uh, informality and so on, and try to find a way out of formality, informality, which is not a big issue in the GCC, by the way. Uh, and then you have to have clusters that are uh, linked to productive cities. And then you have to have a decentralized system of government, because I think to the extent that you wanted really productive cities to become uh, prosperous and flexible and agile uh, and to avoid gridlock, you need to actually also think about a, a transition from a top-down uh, centralized system of government to a much more decentralized system of government. Also, uh, universities, uh, especially the research capacity of universities, has to be significantly enhanced and linked to laboratories uh, in order to allow the uh, firms in a cluster uh, to acquire knowledge and to train, uh, you know, firms themselves so that they can actually compete uh, globally and regionally. So I do see actually uh, this to be a, a positive uh, competition, but success requires that actually it shouldn't be egocentric. It, really sh it shouldn't be a GCC-centered uh, competition. It should be actually opening up for some sort of a global positioning of the economies of the, of the GCC. And I would also urge uh, supranational approaches uh, because uh, even with Saudi Arabia, uh, I think economies need to be enlarged. And so to the extent that there is possibility of uh, uh, coordination and harmonization of policies uh, and also regional infrastructure development, railway systems uh, across the GCC economies, I think this will all the more enhance the competitiveness uh, of the of the economies uh, of the individual countries as well as collectively for the GCC. Yes, in fact, I, I was visiting the, the Baraka plant. I was saying uh, the nuclear facility in the UAE, and they're already talking about uh, loading up into the grid cross borders. Again, that wasn't a discussion we would have five years ago. So uh, it is in terms of sharing uh, energy and getting better connected in terms of rail systems as well uh, for the transport of goods. Uh, Jihad, you have the final word, and then I'll, I'll summarize very quickly. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, let me maybe start with uh, where Dr. Rahim left. It's a positive sum game that uh, countries need to aim at. Competition is welcome, and competition is not against, I would say, cooperation. You can compete and cooperate at the same time. We have several countries uh, who are doing this. We see uh, this in Europe, Latin America, and Asia, and therefore, I think competition should go hand in hand with further cooperation because of the relatively small size of the markets. Second, I think uh, uh, this crisis has showed us that you cannot close your barriers. Uh, even country like China is dependent on the rest of the world. And therefore it should not become uh, erecting walls between countries. For the competition to be successful, 
it has also to provide and to equalize uh, and to level the playing field uh, by reducing barriers, uh, providing the same level of support to, uh, to everyone who enters the market and to provide better access to finance, better access to talents. And this will allow the market to grow. We did recently a study back in 2019 that if only you reduce the barriers between Maghreb countries, you can create 1% um, growth. And then you can move from national market to 100 million consumer market for, for uh, populations that are very similar to each other. And this could provide millions of job opportunities. Therefore, yes, the competition is in the cooperation what needs to be done. But let me maybe end on the point that uh, uh, we have uh, all of us allude to is if we want to see the region growing faster, we need to be very, um, I would say, bold on accelerating the trends and keeping those uh, changes and strengthening them. Um, Fadi was mentioning that in, in few months, uh, uh, central banks moved uh, to using mobile money. They need to accelerate, go to the digital money. Um, we saw education moving. We need to accelerate that. Uh, Brahim was saying uh, the importance of university collaboration. We need to reach a much higher level because without research, it's impossible to grow. We saw this with the pandemic. There are new sectors. We can compete. UAE is going to produce vaccine. Morocco is going to produce vaccine. Egypt is thinking of producing vaccine. I think we can compete. And all those are very important, but we should not lose sight that there are two important additional things. Stability matter, and this is maybe some time. We are taxed at the fund coming with always, you know, those messages. Because the lack of stability is lack of investment increase in your risk premium. And it's impossible to do a huge transformation and leapfrog your growth without that. And my last point is solidarity is important within the society. And this is where social is very important. And solidarity between countries, and this is where cooperation is very important. And I think this region has to offer a lot because it sits at a very critical and strategic uh, position. We saw it with the Suez Canal a few weeks ago. Mm. It tells you how important the region is. We need to use those um, strengths in order to build forward better and use this crisis as a momentum to address the challenges. And it would be easy. Uh, let me say this. It wouldn't be easy. But I don't see another way that is better than this one. Great, thanks, Jihad. It was very interesting to watch because I covered the Suez uh, crisis, how quickly the Egyptians mobilized, right? So what they didn't have in equipment, uh, they brought to the fore and then they reached out uh, in terms of dredging uh, expertise uh, far and wide to solve it within a five-day window. So it was quite extraordinary knowing the dependency, uh, dependency we have on the being at the crossroads and having that artery right through the heart of uh, the, the MENA region. Uh, I think it was an excellent panel. I appreciate you covering all the diversity of questions. Uh, we appreciate the questions coming in from the social media platforms and also through the chat box as well. Uh, they're quite challenging ones, so I'm glad our panel took them. Uh, I just want to give a thanks again to Sarah al uh, Suhaimi of uh, the Saudi uh, Arabia Stock Exchange or the Saudi uh, group, as is going to be known now, uh, at Tadawal. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim uh, Al Badawi, the managing director of the Economic Research uh, Forum, joining us from Dubai today, but normally based in uh, Cairo. Fadig Andur, always a pleasure, uh, joining us from Dubai. Uh, and Jihad Azur, of course, our host, uh, joining us from Washington from the uh, International Monetary Fund. Jihad, another uh, thanks to your group yet again because of the planning that we put into uh, a structure like this. And it's why it goes so smoothly each time uh, your, your back end is excellent. Uh, and it's not too surprising knowing that you lead the department, but thanks again for the invitation and thank you for the questions from the audience as well. My pleasure. Thank you.